Hello, and welcome back to Compressible Flow. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today, we'll be talking about a number of topics. First, we'll be talking about Prandtl-Meyer expansion waves in nozzles, but later in this class, not this particular one, we'll look at the so-called method of characteristics for the nozzles. Then we'll look at Prandtl-Meyer expansion waves and the so-called maximum turning angle. We looked at this and derived this in a previous class. Today we'll revise it again, but look at it in application to show you where we might see these large turning angles of expansions, in particular in space applications. Then we'll look at the particular applications of our theory for inlets. Recall earlier in the classes we looked at inlets with oblique shock waves and normal shock waves in front of them. Now, today, of course, we'll look at more complicated inlets which combines our beautiful shock and expansions theory for particular problems. Let's get started. Let's once again return to the prandtl meyer expansion. In this case, in figure 319 of this particular slide deck, I have shown a double expansion. The flow moves from left to right, and there's in fact two turns of the flow, which turn the flow out of itself, if you will, with slang, and then of course expansion waves form at the particular parts or corners or where the flow is turned. Therefore, we have three regions, region one, two, and three, and two expansion waves, um, fans, excuse me, that uh, are attached to the corners, as shown here and here with my mouse. The incoming flow might be, in this example, seen as the transonic condition with, of course, a prandtl meyer function nu of zero degrees. Through the first expansion, there's a particular angle, which, of course, gives us a higher Mach number, and then a final turn, which gives us an even higher Mach number, where m2 is greater than m1, which is after the, of course, second expansion. We'll have two particular turning angles. Let's we'll say it's V1 and delta, and therefore the total turning angle of the entire flow might be, of course, the summation of the two, which would be, say, V sub 2. Now you'll indeed note something interesting here that, of course, we could cross from 1 to, say, Mach 2 instantaneously and not have to worry about the intermediate step. Also recall that Prandtl-Meyer flow, fans specifically, is an isentropic flow. So we call this the double turning angle flow, which consists of only two Prandtl-Meyer expansion fans. Note that if we start at Mach 1, then of course our initial Prandtl-Meyer angle is zero according to our derived equation. Through the first and second corners, we do indeed have supersonic flow. In fact, we could replace this system of expansions by a particular expansion or diverging part of the so-called de Laval nozzle. You can see that they're very much equivalent. These multiple expansions on a wall also expand the flow just like a nozzle flow would. In fact, it's the expansions within the nozzle, a converging diverging nozzle that is, with supersonic flow in the divergent part, this is expanding the flow. So the expansions are performed, of course, and the acceleration of the flow by the fans themselves. We'll always be accelerating through the system of fans. We cannot deaccelerate. That would require, of course, a different type of flow geometry. <clears throat> in all these cases, the prandtl meyer angle and function is increased as we go through additional turning angles along each particular fan. Remember, the prandtl meyer function and angles are increasing as we move down and accelerate through the flow. They're not decreasing, which is important to remember for these problems. Let's now turn and look at the same idea, but through a nozzle problem. Instead of having, say, one or two or three or maybe five or whatever finite number of turns in an expansion, we might have what we view as an infinite number of turns like we see in the divergent part of the nozzle. You can see at the transonic condition in figure 320 of the particular fly, slide deck, we have Mach 1. And some downstream locations, we might have Mach 2 and 3, etc. We also plot the corresponding area ratios relative to the choke throat, A over A sup stars 1, 1.69, and 4.24. You can see there's relative turning angles for each of these corresponding Mach angles. That is the prandtl meyer function angles are 0, 26.4 degrees, and 49.8 degrees. Now, the angle is going to be a cumulative angle 
That is, we can sum them, starting at Mach 1 through where we find a particular final Mach number. In this particular example, it's 3. And so we can just sum the angles or do an integral if it's a continuous turn. Either way, we'll find the same particular answer. So you can see the actual fan does not have to be particularly centered at one point within the flow. and can actually be centered on multiple parts of the flow. Now this indeed conflicts with what we've learned in our one-dimensional flow theory from earlier in the class for isentropic flow. Indeed, this flow is isentropic, but this is closer to what reality is occurring. Of course, the actual nozzle is not a variable area stream tube. It actually corresponds to a system of expansion fans, which is the real reason, of course, that flow is expanding and accelerating through the nozzle. Indeed, the one-dimensional theory neglects the entire idea of the turning angles within the Delaval nozzle, but yet it still predicts the global flow properties down the center line of the nozzle. We have to look at these types of two-dimensional diagrams to truly understand the Delaval nozzles or the systems of the expansion waves, which is letting our flow accelerate from left to right in this case. Now let's look at that diagram, but with a particular Schlieren. Here we see a Schlieren in 321, which I write is an image of density gradients within the expansion waves of a method of characteristics nozzle. The top image, of course, is the Schlieren images. The bottom image in 321, indeed, is the characteristic net of expansion waves, which we'll derive in a following class. In this particular case, we have a two-dimensional it's a physical nozzle, it's just a very, very large aspect ratio nozzle, but it's two-dimensional flow indeed inside the interior center plane. And the flow expands in the diverging part of the nozzle from left to right, and you can see indeed we have so-called Prantl-Meyer expansion waves seen in the nozzle. Look at this checkered pattern. It's a fans coming off the left wall, which are running right, and the right wall, which are running left respectively through the whole nozzle flow. Turbulent shear layers form after the nozzle exit. In fact, you can see that the total turning angle of the flow from the throat to the exit is indeed 26.4 degrees. Of course, this has been published in Matsuo by Matsuo Kyushu University, which is in Japan. So you can see, indeed, the calculation of left and right running waves actually directly corresponds to those within the nozzle. This is exactly seen like what Theodore Meyer showed in his experiments at, of course, University of Gottingen before World War I. Now the fans will contribute to the total turning angle required to reach the desired fully expanded Mach number M sub J. And you can also see that the fans are terminating along this particular wall. In fact, this wall, the upper wall, is turning into the flow, but no shock waves are being formed. Why is that? Because of course the characteristic net is bouncing off the wall and being canceled by the turning of the wall, and therefore we don't find the reflections. Indeed, in this area of the nozzle, which is in the interior of the flow, we are not finding any waves at all because they've all been terminated by, of course, the wall itself. And in this region, we find our fully expanding Mach numbers. In reality, the flow is still expanding in this area a tiny bit, and you'll reach the total fully expanded Mach number downstream of the nozzle exit, right here where my cursor is moving. So you can see in this photo, we find a Mach 2 flow, and the bottom half is of course designed the method of characteristics, which we'll be presenting in a couple classes. Let's now return and look at the so-called Prantl-Meyer flows and fans. Here's one relative and simple example, and we want to show more examples of this to illustrate the most fundamental problems and their solutions of Prantl-Meyer flow and their solutions respectively. It's relatively simple since the entire flow and fan is isentropic. Remember, everywhere within the flow region, this is a solid body, the flow is completely isentropic. In fact, we can draw streamlines through this flow which are being bent continuously. The fan does not redirect the streamline instantaneously anywhere in the particular flow. Now remember, for a flow as we sketch here, there's an initial Mach number M1 and it can indeed be used to redirect the flow to the supersonic speeds. If we know properties at M1 and M2, and rather total pressure or total temperatures, we can find all other thermodynamic variables and flow directions. Indeed, all these properties correspond to relative Prandtl-Meyer angles, V1, and Mach angles, Mu1, in region M1, or region 1, before the fan, where the flow is undisturbed and moving at some supersonic Mach number. 
Remember in state one, if our Mach number is less than one and we go through a turn, no expansion fan will form, as we showed and proved mathematically in, of course, our previous class in the derivation of the Prandtl-Meyer expansion fans. Now remember, if the flow is turned through an expansion fan at, say, some angle theta or delta in the chart, see there's the angle theta or delta, then the turning angle of the flow, of course, will be the initial Prandtl-Meyer angle plus theta, the turning angle, will give us a new Prandtl-Meyer angle in region two. And we derive this equation, of course, in our previous classes on the derivation of Prandtl-Meyer flow. And it's really important to remember that equation. Now let's look at figure 323. And in fact, we find three types, and I could draw an infinite number of types of walls that turn, of Prandtl-Meyer expansion fans. The first one, we have a supersonic Mach number. The second, we have a supersonic Mach number. And the third one, we have a supersonic Mach number. Let's say they're all the same value of M1. For example, it could be 1.5. Now, in the first case on the left, you'll see that all the fans indeed are attached to the wall. And there's a particular fan angle. This can be seen as a sharp corner case in the middle. Or we could simply round out that corner and have like a rounded case. In the rounding case, the expansion fans will not be connected to a single point at the wall as if it was a sharp corner. Nonetheless, in each case, the flow remains attached and we move around the corner and we accelerate the flow. Indeed, if we look in region two in the first case, which is a sharp corner, or region two in the second case, which is a rounded corner, you'll find the exact same Mach numbers and thermodynamic properties and velocity vectors except they'll just be at a slightly different location because of course the geometry is different. But nonetheless, the fluid dynamics process is exactly the same in these particular cases. And this goes along with the examples I shown earlier in this class. For example, the nozzle case could of course have an instantaneous turn and have an expansion fan all located at one position in the nozzle. Of course, we won't have nice isentropic flow through the whole nozzle and shocks will form as the waves are coalescing downstream due to the sharp corner. Indeed, the method of characteristics case is the only type of nozzle case where we can achieve this type of particular flow. Now, some other ideas to remember. Remember, the ratio of the properties will also be the same through any type of expansion fan. As long as I have supersonic flow and I move around the corner and remain attached, I will always have, as long as expansion fan process is happening, the same ratios of the thermodynamic properties. Now remember also, since it's isentropic, the stagnation pressures, temperatures, speeds of sounds, stagnation densities are all constant through the particular isentropic fan system on each individual streamline, and in fact, through the entire flow field. This also happens in three dimensions around like say axisymmetric bodies. And of course, our equations will remain the same. We can still use Prandtl-Meyer expansion theory. Now the fan angles, the fan angles will always be determined as the difference between the Mach angles on each side of the fan. And we haven't shown this before, so here's something particularly new and important. You can write that the fan angles will be the differences of the Mach angles plus the turning angles, which will also be equal to the differences of the Prandtl-Meyer function angles, which are in degrees, plus the differences of the Mach angles. And you can show this mathematically for any type of flow through expansion fans. It will not matter, absolutely will not matter, for the equations if the flow is isentropic, if the flow angles turns to your say, angle theta, or any other type of angle, if it's a sharp corner, rounded corner, or rounded corner with a very large radius of curvature, you can draw any one you want as long as the turning angle continuously increases. And not in a continuum fashion, you can have a discontinuous angle, but it must continually increase. If for any reason along that supersonic flow in a fan, you have a, even a small region where the angle decreases and turns the flow into itself, then a shock will occur and the whole system might be disrupted. Of course, only the beginning and ending states matter, that is state one and two through any particular expansion fan. So watch this carefully as you develop your solutions. Now, let's look at a few examples. Example one, let's say we have a Mach number two flow with a static pressure, P1, of three atmospheres and a static temperature of 300 Kelvin. 
and we'll say it goes through an expansion totaling 30 degrees in a corner. But the corner could be rounded or smooth, it doesn't matter. Just remember that's invariant of the problem, as long as an expansion fan forms and is attached to the wall. Now we need to determine the downstream conditions after the fan. Mach 2, the Mach number at region 2, the static and pressure, the static temperature, the total pressure, and the total temperature. Remember, PO2 and TO2 will certainly be equal to TO1 and PO1. The total pressure or stagnation pressure is conserved, constant through the whole flow. This is very easy. We can use our isentropic equations, which we earlier developed, and looked at region 1 only. You'll find at Mach 1, which is equal to 2 from our problem definition, we can instantly obtain through the Prandtl-Meyer equation a Prandtl-Meyer angle in area 1, or region 1, of 26.38 degrees. We can also find the corresponding total temperature to temperature ratio and total pressure to pressure ratio in region 1. And we'll find through the isentropic equations for M1 equals 2, 0 0.1278 and T over T naught of 0 0.5556. Now, we're given P1 and T1. We can now use these two particular ratios to find the total pressure and total temperature in region 1. You can write P01 equals P1 divided by 0 0.1728 for my ratio here, which will be 23.5 atm. We can also find T01 equals T1 divided by 0 0.5556 equals 540 Kelvin. We can now go and determine the value of, of course, the second Prandtl-Meyer turning angle through our workhorse equation across the fan. The turning angle equals the differences of the Prandtl-Meyer angles. Well, we can write, of course, now for region 2, 26.38 degrees, which is the turning angle in region 1, plus 30 degrees, which is the turning angle of the flow. So 26.38 is the Prandtl-Meyer degrees from m equals 1, and 30 degrees is the angle which the flow turns. We add them, and of course, we find 56.38 degrees. That is indeed what? The Prandtl-Meyer angle in region 2. We can now use the isentropic calculators for Prandtl-Meyer function. We can now use the Prandtl-Meyer function equation, or we can use the tables and look up 56.38 degrees. Solving this equation, you'll find a new Mach number 2 of 3.37. You'll also find through the isentropic relations in region 2 for Mach 3.37, PO2 over P2 and TO2 over T2. Remember, PO1 is equal to PO2 and TO2 is equal to TO1. Therefore, we know PO2 and PO over 1 from the second step of the solution. Now, all we have to do is multiply through to find static pressure and static temperature in region 2, the ratios, or we can just hold it constant and use, of course, the isentropic relations with Mach 3.37. I've done this work for you here in this diagram, and this diagram, of course, illustrates the entire problem. Here we have Mach 2, we go through a fan, a 30 degree turning angle, and we find M2 equals 3.37. You'll find that the static and temperature, static pressure and static temperature, in region 2 is indeed 0 0.3713 atm and 165 kelvin. Let's check our work to make sure it makes physical sense. Now the flow has expanded and our Mach number has increased. That's good. We find that, of course, since the flow has expanded, that the pressure and temperature have gone down respectively. We started out with 3 atm, and went down to 0 0.3713 atm. And we started with 300 kelvin, which is a little bit warm, and we went down to half, of course, the value to 165 kelvin. We dropped by, of course, 140, 35 degrees. Now, let's continue for another example. In this case, let's say that a very weak shock wave with a particular angle of 44 degrees is in a horizontal planar supersonic jet at Mach equals 2. It will strike a free jet boundary that is a turbulent shear layer as shown in the problem down here. So in region 1 we have a pressure which is equals to say the initial ambient pressure and we have an increased Mach number and outside on the other of the shear layer we have Mach equals 0. 
The shock wave moves along and impinges on the sh shear layer and reflexes an expansion wave. And there's a new boundary of the shear layer, which is deflected down by some angle delta. This deflection is dictated by matching the pressure after the expansion to the ambient pressure, which is a requirement, of course, of the shear layer in this case. So you see in region one, the first shock cell, if you will, the pressure is equal to the ambient. In region two, the pressure is higher than the ambient because it went through this shock, which raised the pressure. And then expansion forms to rematch the pressure with the ambient in region three. So we have three regions, Mach one, two, three. And of course, this problem can be solved as a marching problem moving downstream. So after the reflection, this wave reflects as an expansion in the left running direction from an initial right running oblique shock wave. What a beautiful flow physics problem. And of course, after the expansion, we have Mach 3. The only place isentropic flow occurs in the system is, of course, in the shear layer and, of course, across the oblique shock wave. Everything else is isentropic flow. So indeed, of course, in region one, the total pressures are, for example, not equal to the total pressures in region three. That's because we've lost total pressure across the shock wave and also, of course, other uh, like total density variable. Let's look at the particular solution, which I'll read to you and explain. We'll first use the oblique shock wave calculator or charts. We need to move from region one to two. It's a marching problem. We know what the values are in region 1, and we need to cross the shockway and find the values in region 2. So we do the shockway problem. So we'll look up the particular shock angle, which we were given as 44 degrees, and an incoming Mach number of 2. Indeed, we fly, find a flow deflection angle from the theta beta Mach number equation of 14 degrees. From that angle, we can find, of course, crossing normal shock, we can find M2, that's a normal shock relative to the oblique shock front of a Mach number M2 1.49. And we find a static pressure rise from that shock relation and P2 over P1 is 2.1. We'll need this to, of course, analyze the free boundary problem. Now, the static pressure has gone up by a ratio of 2.1. That's 2.1 atm in region 2. If you don't understand the shockwave problem, you'll have to go back and review the oblique shockwave module. As we've just done the standard planar oblique shockwave problem using the theta beta Mach number equation. Next we need to go re from region 2 to region 3. This shouldn't be much of a problem now because we need to go through an expansion. But remember the pressure must be lowered from 2.1 atm to 1 atm by the expansion because of course P3 must be equal to P1 because it's equal to the atmospheric pressure as I just previously explained. There can be no static pressure change across that particular shear layer, otherwise it would be bending and we wouldn't have a nice uniform shock structure. Therefore, you might write P3 over P2 equals P1 over P2. That is, you'll have the inverse ratio of pressures across the expansion of shock to retain and obtain, once again, the atmospheric pressure in region 3. If you put in these ratios, you'll find, of course, a value of 0 0.48, which is the inverse of roughly 2.1. Now indeed, we would enter the isentropic tables at M2 of 1.49, which is of course the Mach number in region two, and obtain P2 over PT2, which is 0 0.76. So that's the total pressure over the static pressure ratio for Mach number 1.49 from the isentropic equations in region two. You can also pull out the Prandtl-Meyer angle, which is Prandtl-Meyer function, 11.61 degrees at Mach two from the table or Prandtl-Meyer function equation. Because, of course, now we're preparing to cross the expansion wave from region 2 to 3. You'll see now that across the expansion fan, the total pressure is constant, and therefore we can write a simple chain rule to solve the problem. We might write P3 over PT3 equals P2 over P2 times T2 over T2 times P3 over TT. PT3, where T is, of course, the total condition. I can then rearrange into values that I know. For example, I know PT, P2 over PT2, which I just found. I know PT2 over PT3, which is 1, the total pressure is conserved across the expansion. And I know, of course, P3 over P2, which is, of course, 0 0.48. So I've been keen and wrote out this little expansion so I can write it in terms of known values and find P3 over PT3. Here I can write now, fill in my values, 
0 0.276 times 1 times 0 0.48 equals 0 0.132. Great, now I know PT3 over P3. I can now enter my isentropic tables or use my isentropic equation for PT over P as a function of Mach number and gamma, and I can solve for the left-hand side and I'll get a value excuse me, solve for the Mach number in the equation, M3, and I'll get a value of 1.98. And also at that particular row or value of the table, I can then use M3 of 1.98 to evaluate once again the Perelmeyer expansion fan equation, and I get 25.83 degrees. I can now use the Perelmeyer expansion fan equation, which we previously developed, to determine the deflection angle of the free boundary and measured it from the horizontal direction as shown in this particular figure. Once again, I can add my deflection angles with the particular Prandtl-Meyer function difference and fill in the values here, which you'll see is 14 degrees plus 25.83 degrees minus 11.6 degrees, which of course are the Prandtl-Meyer functions in region three minus region two, which you just found. Evaluating this equation, we'll now have 28.2 degrees, which is of course now our change in angle. And of course, from there, you can solve for the other thermodynamic values because you know the angles, you know the Mach numbers, and you know the total conditions, and the solution is closed. Indeed, I encourage you to try out this particular problem because of course you know the results and the previous one to solidify these concepts of shocks and expansion systems in your mind. In fact, there's more complicated problems where this system of shocks and expansions occurs over and over and over again to create the shock cell structure you see in off-design supersonic jets. Let's now look at the famous Prandtl-Meyer turning angle as a function of Mach number once again, which we haven't looked at. Remember, the Prandtl-Meyer function, which is the turning angle in degrees, is a function of gamma and m. Let's let Mach number vary from 1, because it must be supersonic, all the way to 20. And this is a picture which was used from Wikipedia, co common uh, trademark value. And the y-axis is, of course, the Prandtl-Meyer turning angle in degrees. Now we plot it for three different values of gamma. We do it for 1.33, 1.40, and 1.67. You can see as gamma increases, of course, we get a lower and lower potential maximum turning angle for large Mach numbers. Remember our previous asymptotic analysis, we showed that for gamma 1.4, the Prandtl-Meyer function angle is about 130 some degrees as m goes to infinity. Of course, we never achieve these in practice because of course it becomes a vacuum, or do we? Now the maximum turning angle is a very interesting result because of course we took the limit as Mach number goes to infinity and found an asymptotic solution for gamma 1.4 as we showed in the previous class. Remember, this is an angle with which the flow would have to be turned to produce an infinite Mach number. But of course it's rather impractical because we would achieve a perfect gap vacuum of P infinity equals zero and M equals infinity. Now this is generally hard to do on the surface of a planet, but on the other hand, if we were outer space, of course the ambient pressure is near zero. And therefore, if we eject our fluid through a nozzle, we would expand our flow through huge turning angles and indeed see very, very large turning angles if we could visualize this in space. This might be viewed through in our understanding of particular movies. For example, in Buck Rogers in the 25th century, there's a particular cartoon shown. Look at the exhaust of their jet flow in outer space from their nozzle. It looks as like a lazily drawn flame, but this is totally unphysical and it's only artistic. We would actually expect to see a large expansion going in all directions because of course we're exhausting our fluid through our CD nozzle into the atmosphere and it would accelerate supersonically and exhaust in directions which are of course normal to the direction of the exhaust from the flow. This is rather unrealistic. Let's look at a few other pictures to see what might happen in reality. Now in the upper left is a caricature of what might be happening in a real flow from an engine. Indeed, we would expect very large expansion angles through the CD nozzle or Laval nozzle of an actual engine. And these little lines might be seen as the expansion angles, which we've drawn as approximately 130 degrees for a gamma value. See, it actually expands in the direction of the aircraft. 
or a flight vehicle in space, which will give us, of course, a slightly negative thrust. You might say this is not just a caricature, but as you can see on the right, a burn from the main space shuttle engines, where you see a large amount of the exhaust going up and to the sides of the engine. This is is because, of course, expansion fans indeed are attached to the nozzle lip and it's expanding the flow and it has a huge turning angle because, of course, the vacuum pressure is approximately a vacuum, of course, in the ambient environment, which in this case is outer space. This causes, of course, the flow to make these strong angles. This can also be seen in the takeoff of the Apollo 16 Orion capsule. Here it is, where the engine is just firing after liftoff from the lunar surface. Indeed, the flow comes down and it's wrapped around very large and it ejects debris in large angles relative to the flow direction. Indeed, the expansion, the large expansions on the lunar surface are also much larger than, say, 90 degrees, and this causes large debris to actually go in the direction of the vehicle. It's an amazing phenomenon, which is, of course, shown through the Pranemeyer theory, where the flow expands and the expansion is attached to the nozzle up of the vehicle, and it causes, of course, the exhaust um, matter and materials from the engine to go in the normal directions from the space vehicle flight trajectory. Let's now change our attention to the so-called oblique shock inlets for very high speed aircraft. We already looked at this topic a little bit through the idea of normal shocks and inlets and diffusers, but we did not treat the subject adequately for the ideas of jet propulsion. Let's apply our theories now and look at particular concepts. Remember, the losses are just too large for particular Mach numbers M1 above 1 for a supersonic inlet, where a normal shock might form. In fact, we have huge total pressure losses, which can bring our total pressure down to like, you know, a tenth of an atmosphere, which is horrible for the operation and efficiency of these types of air-breathing engines in the atmosphere. Remember, the purpose of an aircraft inlet or a supersonic diffuser in, say, a wind tunnel is to slow the flow down to subsonic speeds as low as possible with minimal losses of, say, the total values. In this case, total pressure is the most important value. This is in order, of course, to promote efficiency of the engines. And when you're learning in your propulsion classes, this will be critical to have high efficiency in your engines. We are wasting energy by deaccelerating our flow through non-isentropic processes. Of course, in reality, we'll always have entropy increase and total pressure losses. Now, remember, small losses arise through a series of a few oblique shocks through small turning angle theta, even when M is large relative to a single normal shock. And we show that example for two oblique shocks, which are weak relative to one normal shock in previous classes in an example. The idea of combining shock wave with expansion waves for diffusers allows us to build extremely efficient high-speed supersonic inlets, and we'll show a few examples of those in this class. And of course, you can use all the theories we developed to design your own inlets, or at least understand them, before you get into computational fluid dynamics or experimental work. Remember, through a very few series of relatively weak shocks, we can reduce the incoming flow Mach number from some high supersonic value to values much less than 1.4. We can then terminate the flow through a normal shock after a system of oblique shocks to return the flow to a subsonic state while having only a minimal entropy loss. In fact, many supersonic wind tunnels have systems of oblique shocks and then a terminal normal shock to bring the flow to subsonic speeds with minimal total pressure loss. So in fact, often a normal shock is used. It's just used at the end of the train of shock waves at the inlet. This is what happens in reality and practice most of the times, especially for the supersonic wind tunnels, and also occurs in many rectangular cross-sections like you see on modern fighter aircraft in round axisymmetric inlets. Here's one particular example where it's very simple. Once again, we have a center body and a cowl in figure 328 and an oblique shock or conical oblique shock or planar oblique shock, depending, depending on the geometry, will attach to the leading edge of the vehicle. It will attach to the leading edge of the vehicle and hit the leaning part of the cowl and bounce back and go back and forth through the whole body many times, maybe 10 or 12 times, and it brings the flow through small changes of total pressure 
all the way down to a terminal normal shock, which stands in the diverging section of the diffuser of the inlet, the supersonic inlet. Now the center body, or cowl, can move back and forth to change the angle and make sure that this oblique shock is contained and creates this shock cell system inside the center body. So these inlet diff designers have to create variable area geometries, and it's usually done by changing the arrow spike or something about the cowl geometry. And we'll look at these particular cases in a few minutes. Remember, no supersonic aircraft, because of this physics, has the so-called luxury of efficient performance at only one Mach number. They have to fly at different Mach numbers at cruise or doing, say, high flight speed maneuvers. And therefore, we need variable areas. It also helps us with, of course, of accelerating and reaching those high speed values so we can have low efficiency acceleration. Now below about Mach 2, it's absolutely impossible to obtain good efficiency with a fixed transonic speeds and crews that say Mach 1.7, they almost always have variable area inlets. It's absolutely true that these inlets are generally hydraulically driven, that is, the aerospike spike or the variable area geometry changes with a hydraulic system within the aircraft. And this is done to in order to optimize the performance of particular flight Mach numbers. Earlier, we saw particular one-dimensional normal shock inlets. But let's look at some recent and historical and contemporary aircraft with, of course, the sophisticated inlets which are moving. And of course, these inlets can often be derived directly from simple 2D or axisymmetric theory. Of course, modern aircraft have the advantage of having computers for design where they're designed with computational fluid dynamics. Here's one particular inlet from the so-called F-104 Starfighter, which is still in use for aeronautics research at NASA and other organizations. Here on the left in figure 2329 of the slide deck, you will see particular aerospike inlet. And the aerospike is shown as this black cone, and here's the outer call like I showed in the previous diagram. You'll indeed see that two schlieren of this exact geometry from the side can be shown where indeed the inlet is working properly at supersonic speeds, and the oblique shockwave, which is conic, moves off the cone from a deflection angle, half deflection angle, and hits the cowl, and there's actually a shockwave system in the engine which bounces back and forth and terminates with a normal shock after a converging diverging duct into the compressor stage, which is to the right. Now, if the inlet is unstarted, or stalled, or the shock is disgorged, you'll get a situation like in the lower right from this NACA Schlieren. You'll see indeed, once again, we have the same oblique shock system, but now a normal shock stands in front of the engine face. Indeed, you know from normal shock theory that the Mach number will be subsonic in this region after the normal shock and will have subsonic flow. And this normal shock occurs at a very, very high Mach number, and therefore we have a huge total pressure loss. And of course, the whole inlet and engine can stall in this situation and would have to be restarted in flight. In fact, engine stall or disgorging the shock is very violent for aircrafts and can cause, of course, flight vehicle failure. Here's another image of a more contemporary inlet, and this is called, through slang, the so-called armpit inlet because it sits below the wing and on the fuselage, and it has a much more complicated design. You can see here the cowl is a half circle, and there's some way to generate the oblique shock waves to try and get them to impinge on the half circle. In this particular case, the shock system resides in this very short inlet before the fan face. They've also added in these so-called vortex generators inside the inlet, and these are used to try and attempt to reduce the control of boundary layer separation, which would cause large turbulent structures to impinge on the fan face and reduce engine performance. Other ways to reduce boundular separation, of course, are bleed, where we have many, many thousands of holes in the inlet face that suck the air to stabilize the boundary layer. Anytime a shock wave interacts with the boundary layer, it might cause it to separate, and therefore technology like vortex generators or suction within the inlet walls are indeed used to control and maintain the boundary layer from separating. So these inlets, of course, are designed through a lot of trial and error, computational fluid dynamics, and some, of course, skill and knowledge. Let's look at this famous F-15 aircraft, which is, of course, built in the United States. Here on the left, one particular engine inlet is in the subsonic 
configuration, and the right one is in the supersonic configuration. So you see they each have a cowl, but there's no arrow spike here, which are, of course are now out of favor for these type of aircraft. You can see that an oblique shockwave really forms at the leading edge, and it moves down and is even with the planes. And so the oblique shock of its angle can be adjusted by changing the upper planes of the F-15. In fact, there's wonderful videos online of these planes changing in flight as the aircraft moves. And you can actually hear the hydraulic system changing the inlet shape as the pilot accelerates in the F-15 Eagle. Here's one particular diagram which is simplified for this particular system. In fact, this one is for the famous Concorde aircraft. Here you see in the upper left, you have a flight Mach number of 2.2, which was the flight Mach number of cruise of the Concorde, 2.2. Indeed, in the inlet ramp of the Concorde, you have a system of multiple turning angles at the inlet as the flow moves left to right, and it creates a system of oblique shocks. After each shock, the Mach number is 1.8, 1.6, and 1.4 respectively, and then of course there's a terminal normal shock at the inlet face. That's located right here. And then we have subsonic flow in Mach 0.7. We then have a traditional subsonic diffuser, which opens up in the area as we move downstream, and it deaccelerates the flow from Mach 0.7 to Mach 0.4. You can see that the normal shock loss at delta S is about 1.4, which is on the boundary of weak to strong normal shocks, as we discussed in our normal shock module. In this particular case, it's very advantageous, of course, because our biggest entropy loss is across the Mach 1.4 shock, but it's not that large at all, and we have wonderful total pressure recovery at a low speed subsonic flow before the compressor phase of the engine. This is called a mixed compression type engine, where we actually are compressing the air in front of the actual interior duct. And this is done, of course, in all these systems. In the lower right, we might also show and improve this type of flow for about Mach 2.4 by adding in bleeds into the sides of the wall, which will, of course, stabilize the boundary layer. This will, of course, help reduce the chance of unstart or disgorging the normal shocks through the flow. Here's the picture of the course of the Concorde in figure 333 of this particular slide deck. This is coming in, of course, on takeoff. So we're under the runway and watching takeoff. Now, of course, in this case, the flight vehicle is flying subsonic. Look at the picture of the inlets in the upper left, which we're taking in a flight museum. You can see that there's actually variable area geometry at the inlet, and it's in the subsonic position of the aircraft. As supersonic flight occurs, they'll close these ducts up and they'll close this as a bypass, of course, around the engine for subsonic speeds. We'll, clo we'll close these up and open them up for supersonic conditions. Compare the subsonic configuration of the inlets of the Concorde with that of the F-15. Subsonic here, supersonic here. These are both subsonic. As it goes supersonic, we will close these vents up and send all our air through the engines and of course be more efficient at a case which is of course um, supersonic cruise. And you can see this geometry exactly corresponds to the geometry shown here, but of course flipped upside down for the Concorde case. You can now understand potential designs of future aircraft. Remember the Concorde was the world's first commercial flight operational supersonic transport. The second one was created in the Soviet Union, the USSR, and it was the TU-144. This can also be found online if you're curious. There's an absolute com competition of efficient supersonic flight, and one reason we don't have supersonic aircraft today for large airliners like the Concorde was their inefficient crews and engines. The current supersonic aircraft being designed at the time of making this video usually range in the range of Mach numbers of 1.4 to maybe 1.6 or 7 for crews. Even today, the FAA disapproves overland supersonic flight because of the loud sonic booms that these aircraft create. In fact, if an aircraft flew at Mach 2 from New York to LA, it would create a 100 mile wide sonic boom across the entire United States.
Today, of course, we're trying to design low boom aircraft, and this is one type of low boom future supersonic aircraft for supersonic transport of the future. Look at how different it looks compared to the Concorde. In fact, the engines operate exactly the same principle, but they're mounted above the wing in an attempt to try and reduce traditional noise during takeoff and landing around communities like New York and LA, Paris, and of course Heathrow and London. Nonetheless, they all work by the same concepts in terms of the supersonic inlets and nozzles, which we discussed in this class. Indeed, they're beautiful vehicles, and I'm hoping that in our lifetimes we'll once again fly in commercial supersonic flight. Here's another wonderful example of a supersonic aircraft. This is the so-called XB-70, which is housed one of them at least to my knowledge in the u.s air force museum in dayton ohio the bottom figure in 335 shows the outline of the particular vehicle you can see this vehicle actually has six engines which take up the whole aircraft under the fuselage here's six nozzles one two three four five six now you can see of course it has a delta wing which we can talk about later if you desire and two particular canards there's two inlets each inlet is shown here in the bottom this line here, the middle line, is actually the center line of the aircraft. This outer line here is this horizontal fuselage edge right here. Here's the inlet. This is the lower part of the cowl, which is shown here, and an oblique shockwave forms at the leading part of the cowl shown here, which is shown way up here in the figure. So this is like looking from, indeed, the bottom of the aircraft. Now, once again, a shock wave will form, will have compression. There'll be a ramp here that changes. See, this ramp is taken and take off, so this whole area changes. And it's driven by hydraulics during takeoff. So right now, it's fully opened up, of course, to have subsonic flight during takeoff. And during supersonic flight, it's completely pushed out to create a converging, diverging inlet diffuser to compress the flow. At this point, for supersonic flow, we would indeed be subsonic after a termination normal shock held in the diffuser part of the inlet and we would deaccelerate the flow subsonically to raise and find a total pressure value in fact there's also bleed in these particular aircrafts this particular aircraft the xb-70 flew at a cruise mach number of three in the 1960s compare this type of design to the more contemporary concorde and the even more contemporary and future designs of supersonic transport like shown in figure 334 of the boeing iconic 2 demonstrator let's now return and look at the aerospike engines as a final example you'll see here's the famous sr-71 aerospikes on the left and right you can imagine that these aerospikes move forward and backward during supersonic flight and subsonic flight respectively. A conic oblique shockwave forms at the aerospike and it compresses the air, of course, and the shockwave terminates at the cowl of the vehicle. Here's another picture of the SR-71 aerospike on the ground in a particular museum in Georgia. Now, this particular aircraft was indeed designed by Kelly Johnson, who was at the Lockheed Martin, Martin Skunk Works. You can see his picture in the upper left. We can talk about more of the history of him later. In the lower left, you see this initial A-12 configuration, which is, of course, the predecessor for the indeed SR-71. You can see in this particular aircraft, they had the aerospikes on the left and right, and they would design these aerospike flows with axisymmetric inlets, first 2D, of course. On the right, you can see other earlier concepts of these types of vehicles and how much has changed to the final vehicle. These are interesting preliminary designs of the SR-71 in early test models. It's not like they just sat down and drew the full aircraft. Indeed, they came up with many preliminary concepts until they arrived at the A-12 design, which eventually came the other designs like SR-71. Here's another close-up picture in the museum. You can see here is the aerospike itself, where a very shallow angle occurs where we can move the shockwave to go through the inlet. This is much less complicated indeed than the XB-70 inlet, which is rectangular. In fact, it's much easier to do calculations for these types of aerospikes. But indeed, we have rectangular inlets today because they have certain efficiency advantages. Here's actually the SR-70 inlet diagram in figure 340. This is the exact diagram of the SR-71, uh, with a little bit of detail removed, of course. 
Here's the arrow spike in the center body, and you can see this light blue line is where the shock wave occurs, and it bounces off the cowl. In fact, they have a whole system bleed in there to keep the flow attached, which of course is driven by the engine. It then goes down into the engine fan face. There's also a bypass duct for secondary air. So indeed, there is a bypass in the SR-71 engine, which you'll learn more about in your propulsion classes. Unlike the XB-70, the SR-71 had a published cruise Mach number 3.2, and I am aware from pilot interviews of the SR-71 that they did indeed go on occasion a little bit higher than Mach 3.2, but indeed, this is the unclassified published Mach number. You'll see in this case, we have conic oblique shocks and a conic center body, which can move forward and backward. And this design was actually designed by hand with a team of computers with very little help from digital computers. And this is why it's advantageous to have, of course, an aerospace design because of the ease of design. Here's some notes about the SR-71 if you're curious. Now, the inlet itself was designed with the method of characteristics, which is, of course, a use of a system of expansion waves and then crossing shocks with shock theory. This is one of the original method of characteristics for a flow field in a typical engine inlet, which is an example of what they did with designing the engine inlet of the SR-71. Indeed, if these shock waves are unstarted or disgorged, they'll move forward and cause a huge violent yaw and banging and explosive type sounds of the engine. They would then have to move the arrow spike back and of course slowly move it forward to restart the engine. These controls could be done manually within the SR-71 cockpit. If you go at the US Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, they have a website that shows the inside of these particular cockpits with descriptions, and they can show the exact mechanism where they can control by hand their aerospike spike inlet positions for restarting the engine in flight in case an unstart happened. Here's the engine itself. So here we see in the picture I took next to an SR-71, the famous J-58 engine. In the particular engine, you see a particular fan face. So we're looking downstream from the engine. The air would enter this fan face, which is at the end of the supersonic diffuser. So the actual engine in the aircraft is only in a small part of the entire supersonic duct. The nozzle of the engine is pictured on the left. Here's a picture I'm particularly proud of, of course, of me standing by the engine from the other side. The previous picture in figure 342 is taken from the right looking to the left. Here I'm standing by the nozzle. This is indeed another type of a vol nozzle. And if you look inside, you can actually see the afterburning, or we call them now augmenter elements, which inject fuel into the nozzle to burn, as we discussed earlier in the class, to add, of course, and raise the total temperature and pressure inside the engine. I should probably thank my student Wei Chi Shen for taking this photo. Thank you, Wei Chi. And here's a final photo of the J58 engine from the SR71 looking in the engine. You can see here is where the minimum area is where we choke the throw flow. Here's the augmenter elements where we inject fuel and have a flame holder in the engine. Let's now just take a few more minutes to look at the modes of operation of the SR71 engine. In the first case, in Figure 345 of the SR-71J58 engine operation, we see that indeed there is a bypass flaps in the inlet which forces the flow to go through the turbojet. The flow goes through the turbojet, which is a system of a turbine, combustor, and compressor, which drives the flow in a classical engine case. At high speeds, in the second case, the bypass ducts close. And of course, we have the engine going through the bypass. We then indeed use a system of shock waves and fuel injectors to, of course, have a flame holder which raises the total pressure and temperature, which then exhausts in the nozzle. So we're actually not operating the traditional turbojet when we are operating at high supersonic speeds. This is the exact same type of concept which I discussed in the previous class when we looked at the X43A vehicle. So you can see in this case, once again, we have very nearly no moving parts because of course, we're using shock waves and expansion to compress, burn, and of course, exhaust the flow through the nozzle. In both cases, the nozzles are indeed the same, but in fact, we might have and see those flame holders as we shown in the previous figure, which are these round circular elements, the flame holders. So let's look at one basic example. Let's say we have a rectangular cross-section inlet 
as above shown in the side view, which is functionally similar to the SR-71 inlet, which we just described. Now we'll look at it from a planar point of view, but in reality we would have to assess the ASR-71 engine with axisymmetric formulas. Here we'll do it in 2D for simplicity. Let's say that there's a wedge flow which turns the flow of the engine in front of the engine by the center body aero spike by 10 degrees. And of course, a, ten, a shock wave forms that say beta, and in the diagram we'll call that theta. The distance from the aero spike to the cowl is 2.19 meters, as we've shown here. Given this inlet geometry only, find the flight Mach number that yields the peak efficiency. Now, as you see, all these aero spike engines ideally have the shock wave coming off the aero spike and hitting the cowl exactly. And therefore, just by looking at the geometry of the engine and the wave angle, we might be able to find incoming Mach number for peak efficiency at that position. So we can move the center body forward and backward to achieve peak engine efficiency and avoid disgorging the shock through matching these two equations with theta beta Mach number equation. So we draw the line for peak efficiency. Using trigonometry, we might write the tangent of the shock wave angle will go as one meter over 2.19 meters, which give us a tangent of beta of 0.457. Therefore, beta, by solving tan beta equals 0.457, will be 24.54 degrees. We can then enter our charts for this particular wave angle. These were in two dimensions, and we'll use the two-dimensional charts, and find the corresponding weak shock wave. And indeed, we'll find a Mach number of 3.5 for that flow deflection angle and wave angle beta. So therefore, the cruise Mach number in this particular case for the position, as if it were a 2D engine, not axiometric, is of course 3.5 for maximum efficiency. That's simple, and that's why it's so important in the early part of the Cold War to have guarded pictures of the aerospike geometries of early fighter craft jets. In this class, we looked at particular Pranelmeyer expansion waves in nozzles and the maximum turning angles and looked at these in terms of pictures of two vehicles, the Apollo mission and the space shuttle. Indeed, when we have a vacuum in space, the turning ang angles from the engine turn the flow in perpendicular directions to the aircraft. Then we looked at particular applications of the shock expansion theory for inlets, and we showed a number of contemporary examples for fun, and talked about how the efficiency occurs, and a little bit of applications with bleed, and of course having normal shocks within the engines. And of course we look at the engine cycle, the most basic engine cycle of the famous SR-71 Blackbird. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.